All right, guys, here we go. First special on the Mahi Mahi. There it is. Dorado, dolphin fish, not to be confused like I talked about in our uh, opening video uh, of the actual mammal, the dolphin. Uh, so, what are we talking about today? So we're gonna talk about uh, three key things. Uh, we're gonna start out with some general biology distribution. Um, how does a mahi-mahi develop? Uh, so the biology section there. Uh, then we're gonna move into um, some wave tops of techniques to use to target mahi-mahi. And finally, uh, as we get toward the end of the video, uh, we'll talk about costs um, and uh, maybe even show you some gear uh, that you could possibly use to catch a mahi-mahi. Uh, so without further ado, let's uh, dive right in and uh, get this thing started. All right, guys, to, uh, to start out, we'll talk about the uh, mahi-mahi size. So mahi-mahi can grow up to, up to six feet. I want to anchor on that. However, um, your average mahi-mahi is usually at a maximum of three, all right, 36 inches to four, 48 inches uh, in length, all right, three to four feet. So uh, yeah, I guess you could find a mammoth out there, but most of the time, uh, again, three to four feet. Now, as far as how long they live, so that is kind of interesting. Mahi-mahi are especially uh, short-lived um, ocean creatures. So your maximum, usual maximum uh, lifespan is four to five years. That's the maximum. Uh, the actual found average is around two years. Maximum size takes up to three to four years. So average two years, maximum size three to four years so the average mahi never quite quite reaches that age um, to reach uh, that maximum length um, on average of four feet so just keep that in mind right what does this result in your school size mahi typically uh, we'll call them peanuts up to school size uh, anywhere from a foot and a half, you know, 15, 16 inches, all the way up to um, your lower 20s, right? Uh, maybe even your mid 20s. Your bull dolphin, your big males. Now we're starting to talk about the high 20s, low 30s, even now getting into those 40s. Those abnormal dolphin that have lived longer than two years have uh, evaded predators, become a, a solid predator of their own, um, eating prolific amounts and growing that large. All right, cool. So now we kind of covered size. Now age, so we talked about that, that maximum of five years, absolute uh, typical maximum. Average two years. Now, you're thinking two years, that's not very long. Well, that's where um, this reproductive rate really comes in. It's, uh, it's fairly impressive. So, time to reach um, from hatch, from the moment that it, the, the fish is hatched, time to reach the ability to reproduce is somewhere between 80 to 140 days. 80 to 140 days. All right, that is super short. Um, from the time the egg is fertilized, all right, just an egg, single-celled uh, organism is fertilized, um, to the time that that thing hatches is 44 hours. All right, that is short. That is extremely short. 44 hours, two days, two days. Uh, it's gone from an egg to hatching. A human takes nine months. This happened in two days, uh, so it's wild. All right. From that hatch point, like I talked about, 80 to 140 days. This is gonna depend on the amount of nutrition around them, uh, what they can eat. Mm, hungry. So, now uh, what dolphin eat? All right, cool. So, um, variety of species, right? Think of them as um, almost like a forager, uh, a predatorial forager of, uh, of the water. So, uh, we're talking small fish, juvenile tuna, juvenile billfish, uh, invertebrates, crabs, uh, jacks, pompano, um, you know, um, they'll even eat larvae, like unhatched young of, uh, of bottom fishing species. They'll eat unhatched young, you know, floating in sargasm. I'm looking for physical evidence of the cannibalism. I want to try and find the bones, the evidence that they actually do eat people. All right, cool. So we got that part. All right. Where is the dolphin? <laughs> it's everywhere, right? Um, everywhere that we think of as a warm, uh, subtropical, tropical, 
um, equatorial. It, it's in all of those waters. So this will kind of start bleeding into uh, some of the actual techniques, but we're gonna talk about um, how we find the dolphin. They really, really heavily focus around structure. This does not mean that you can't catch a dolphin in the open water in the middle of nowhere. We've been 130 miles offshore near Boonvang Nansen off of Texas and literally just trolling around near upwelling currents where there happens to be some bait and boom, catch a 30 something inch dolphin. Not out of the question. But if you want to find dolphin on a consistent basis, you're typically looking for anything floating in the water. Um, the longer it's been floating there, the better because it develops barnacles and bait fish start to congregate around it. Um, the, think the food for this foraging predator, for this mahi. Uh, speaking of sargasm, so people typically, um, right, you drive out in the Gulf of Mexico, boom, or you drive off into the Atlantic, um, and how do you find sargasm? Well, typically it's this far from shore. Okay, sure. Um, there are actually uh, studies being conducted because sargasm severely impacts uh, the biology of the water. Okay, it's an algae, right? Sure, it infects the biology of the water. Got it, you're not telling me anything I don't know. Well, um, basically back starting in 2010, sargasm was not found in a lot of the areas it's found now. It's severely affecting some of the Caribbean areas. Um, they're starting to have it show up on shore more. Uh, and um, what that's doing is it's killing a lot of the seagrass uh, as it dies and as it puts more nitrogen uh, and carbon dioxide in the water kills off the seagrass, dying of the seagrass, then affects the local ecology. So what happens to the University of Southern Florida, or South Florida, excuse me, uh, USF, University of South Florida, and NOAA, um, along with help from NASA, uh, basically figured out the reflectivity or, or the, the patterns of, of uh, sargasm and between uh, research vessels, satellites, uh, and um, uh, you know, actual atmospheric studies, they figured out that starting in 2010, the winds changed from Europe, pushed down to the south, and, and I've got a link to this so you can read the full article. I'm not going to you know, give you a synopsis here uh, based on time, but uh, the sargasm basically pushed south uh, to the trade wind um, areas, and then from there, uh, now every spring we get these sargasm blooms, uh, and by uh, middle of summer, October, you're getting sargasm um, coming up on shore in the Caribbean. Cool. The nice thing is they created a tool uh, to track the sargasm balloons and track where the sargasm is. Uh, so here we go. I'll show you this tool. So as you can see, uh, we basically have um, the tool pulled up here. It's uh, on Noah's website. Uh, link will be linked in the description below. So starting out, we have uh, a view of the Gulf of Mexico. We've got Central America, uh, the Greater Antilles, Lesser Antilles. Uh, and then South America there. Uh, of note, it shows kind of the currents uh, in these oceans. You can click on the photo. Uh, from there, the photo comes up. You can magnify the photo. Um, the nice thing is, is even though they're trying to track where it's coming ashore and where it's, it kind of follows the currents, right? Um, but if you notice in some areas, uh, for instance, this time of year near South Florida, uh, north of Miami, uh, I think uh, kind of getting up, um, near Jacksonville, all that area, you can see it leaves the current uh, and possibly comes ashore or even gets closer to shore. Um, so that's why uh, there's certain times of year where it's better um, to uh, find sargasm and find dolphin um, as they're following around uh, this moving structure, right? Cool, so pretty straightforward there. Um, of note, uh, other tools available to you um, so other tools you can use uh, to find uh, the mahi um, is you can use chlorophyll uh, and you can also use um, charts uh, showing water temperature. How's this gonna help you? Well, um, where you have upwelling currents from the bottom in, let's say, uh, somewhere between um, 100 and all the way out to, you know, even 1,000, 1,200 feet of water, um, those upwelling currents in those higher chlorophyll uh, areas um, can show you where the bait fish are congregating, right? Where the bait fish congregate, uh, you'll have these nice lines, these de defined areas 
um, where you will find some of these species. It's not just dolphin, there's other stuff, you know, like tuna, etc. That, that might do this, but it's a, another good way to, uh, to figure out where the dolphin are. So we talked about uh, sargathum. The other thing to note, um, besides the floating structure that we talked about that they like so much, is birds are going to be a huge hint for mahi. This kind of bleeds into techniques. So we talked about finding sargathum and floating structure. If I were to find birds just breaking in the water, it could be mahi, it could be tuna, it could be a lot of species because it's really just some predator pushing bait fish up. I see birds on a piece of floating structure are really, really, really on sargasm or around sargasm or diving near sargasm since gar sargasm is the primary place that dolphins lay their eggs and spawn and sargasm is uh, the primary place, uh, one of their primary places anyway that they feed, now I'm am all amped up, right? Like there's probably some dolphin, uh, it might be tuna, but, uh, or maybe another predator, um, but high probability got some dolphin there. Cool. Just wanted to make sure that that was in there. Um, all right. So now we'll talk about techniques. Um, so the first, uh, technique, uh, is really trolling. Uh, trolling is a, a very viable technique for just about any, uh, ocean species that is sort of near the surface, right? So, um, we didn't talk about in biology, but dolphin typically don't go much deeper than about 300 feet. And even then the 300 feet is usually when they're traveling or, um, or we're just, the bait happens to be that far down and they don't have that structure to find uh, food. So trolling, um, many different ways to troll mahi. They like chuggers. Uh, they like, um, you know, single trolling lures. They really like islanders. Um, if you do an islander with a ballyhoo, um, so just your straight ballyhoo with an islander, that's an excellent uh, trolling lure for mahi. They will hit um, chains. You know, if you do a daisy chain, uh, they will hit that. Um, but uh, you don't typically see people using um, big bars or like um, dredges or something like that with mahi, right? Um, just typically chain single lures um, is what you see trolling. Now, as far as trolling gear, um, this is uh, a pin uh, 12 VISX on a six foot uh, rod. Um, you typically you'll see people trolling gear uh, for multi-purpose trolling gear. They'll use a, a 30 size reel, um, but with mahi, you know, biggest fish you're gonna see there. Um, you know, it's typically gonna be biggest is you know four feet, um, but really like three something. Um, is the biggest you're gonna see. So do you really need a 30 size reel? Not necessarily. Uh, that 12 I just showed you work great um, as well. I got a, a pen torque 30 LD2. Um, this guy uh, will also uh, do just fine for trolling mine. Um, I've got a video real quick. I'm gonna splice in right here. Um, so this is a video from Stan's fam. Uh, and the thing I really wanna show you in this video uh, is I'm guessing they were trolling uh, and they had a school of some larger um, schooling dolphin uh, hit a trolling lure. Um, they could have been casting as well, but just the way the boat is slowly moving, I'm guessing they were moving pretty fast by maybe some sargasm, some sort of structure. Maybe they're just over water. Um, but anyway, so they go basically to a slow kind of walking pace forward, but he keeps the boat moving, um, which I like. That Typically when I'm trolling, if the fish hooks up, I'm going to keep the boat moving. I'm uh, not going to go to idle. Please, please, please don't go to idle. Uh, for a couple reasons. One, uh, if you immediately go to idle, uh, all your lures that were looking good behind the boat aren't looking so good anymore. They're just going to fall and stop moving, uh, stop swimming. Uh, so I'll keep keep the speed going for a little while. You might get uh, a second hookup, third hookup, fourth hookup, who knows, um, depending on how many lines you have trolling. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, um, with a mahi, uh, once one mahi is feeding, um, it doesn't create really a, you could call it a frenzy, but uh, they're not sharks. Uh, it's not like, uh, you can kind of think of it that way, but it's a predatorial fish, right? One fish catch, catches a piece of bait or finds a school of fish and starts feeding. All the others go, oh, hey, it's dinner time. Uh, and then all the other fish will stay fired up. So um, in this video, you can see they slow down the first uh, first person in this video, uh, this lady catches uh, has this mahi, and she's jazzed. You can tell she really wants to reel the mahi in. 
Instead, <laughs> um, Stanley says, no, nope, put it in the rod holder. And you can see she's kind of let down. She ends up catching plenty of mahi, uh, and, and it keeps going on and on and on. Um, the deckhand in this video does a great job gaffing these fish, uh, but it's pretty darn funny. He just, uh, nope, that needs to go in the rod holder. So what he's doing is he's keeping a fish hooked up on a line to keep the school energized and keep the school following the boat. Um, so that's key to Fermahi. Even if uh, you're not trolling like we're seeing in this video, but um, but like we're going to see in this next video, uh, this is Heiko from South, uh, South Florida um, Sport Fishing, uh, or sorry, South Florida Fishing Channel, sorry Heiko. Um, they're just chunking here next to some sargasm. Chunking is another great way you can do it. Stop in the sargasm, see the dolphin, throw some chunks in the water. Dolphin get energized, they start feeding, and then, uh, and then at that point, um, you can cast out to them. Most of the time, especially around Florida, you're gonna see spinning gear for casting. Um, I've got a little conventional pin torque 12. Uh, you could totally use this guy for casting. I've also got a, um, a spinner uh, in the holder over there um, on a seven and a half foot rod. That's really my tuna popper and rod. Um, I also have a shorter uh, six and a half and seven foot uh, spin gear um, for more kind of just pitching dolphin or pitching baits and tunas or something like that. Um, for that technique, you're typically gonna use your anywhere between, uh, depending on how shy they are, anywhere between a four aught, um, not really much smaller four aught. You could use a three aught um, hook, uh, typically a J hook, all the way up to uh, possibly a six uh, a six aught. I don't, really think you need to go too much bigger than that but your miles will vary um, so you can see pitch baiting boom you're just throwing dead bait in front of mahi all right cool that being said mahi can be picky right if, if it's been a full moon they've been feeding all night uh, and they don't want to hit a bait uh, this is a time where you may uh, have to have live bait to really entice them to hit it's not to say that an artificial or, or a chunk bait strip bait uh, won't get them to hit, but sometimes you need a live pilchard, um, finger mullet work great, um, just some sort of live bait. Uh, I typically like to hook them either through the nose or through the back. Uh, I like kind of like the the back because it's wounded, but sometimes you'll they'll be pick, so picky they don't even want a wounded bait. They want a they want a live feisty, hard fighting like going at it bait. Um, that's when I'll hook them through the nose. Uh, typically not hooking them through the tail uh, when I'm pitching the mahi. So hopefully uh, hopefully that's helpful. Those are kind of the two main techniques, right? I'm going to be trolling, hook up, keep the fish in the water, get the school around the boat and just keep catching them. Uh, at that point you start pitching at them. Uh, or um, I'm going to find that piece of structure like we talked about earlier in the, in the biology and now I'm going to, I'm going to pitch um, baits at them, uh, live, dead, uh, artificial, um, and try and entice them to hook up. Uh, typically throwing it slightly in front of the fish, right in front of their head, get their attention, and then just slowly kind of uh, jerking it away from them. If it is just a, uh, a pitch bait, a dead bait, I typically won't pull on it too much. Kind of just let it um, settle down in the water, especially if they're eating other chunk chunk bait that I'm just throwing in the water, chum them kind of. Uh, I'm not going to pull that thing or try and make it look alive because they're eating dead stuff anyway, so what's the point? Um, anyway, that's kind of your, uh, your big mahi techniques, two biggest techniques. Um, there's other small kind of nuances to that, but those are kind of the big ways you're going to catch the mahi. Um, yeah, so hopefully, uh, hopefully this video uh, is helpful. Hopefully you uh, you learned a lot. Um, I don't want to waste too much of your time, so I'm a little long-winded. But uh, yeah, mahi mahi. First coverage. Uh, got to see kind of some of the techniques and stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, get out there, catch them. Tight lines, everybody. Uh, and uh, next week. Uh, we're going to be covering redfish, uh, may even have a guest interview from a friend, uh, so stay tuned, uh, and uh, yeah, we'll see you around.